Hello everyone, this is Jim Phillips. I want to make a quick introduction to the video that you're going to see. I recorded this, oh, it was a few weeks ago, I think about a month ago, as I, my first attempt at explaining this PALS and foam clothing technology, the, its performance, why it works, that's so important to understand. It works in a way that most people don't have any experience, both in the sleeping pod, but also for the clothing. If this program is so important, I want to get out right away with the intention that I'm going to come back after having done this a little bit more because I really like to present programs three or four times and then record them. But uh, this is the first time, but it's important to get it out, so I'm doing it right now. Watch for an update in the future. I welcome you all this morning, a nice uh, Saturday morning. I've got a little bit of a presentation I want to do because I'm working up a um, a new program and a way to present it. I do want to be sure I have any questions covered that you might have along the way on this or any other topic. So does anybody have anything they want to ask uh, right away? And then I'll jump into what I want to share and then get your feedback. You know, I talk about this. I'll just say amazing performance of the um, the sleeping cocoon pod. Now, a lot of you people uh, have been following for a while. You've heard a lot of these things. And so you're you know halfway uh, or mostly educated in this, have a feeling for it. But when I talk to people that first time they've ever heard of it, this foam clothing, anything, it's kind of weird. How do I express to them that this is unique? The performance is quite extraordinary and there's reasons for it. So that's what I'm working to put together is a way of doing that. And of course, you start out one, particularly if you're an engineer and you're trying to teach, you know, it starts out too big, too much, uh, too, too in depth. <clears throat> then you hone it down to where it will be much uh, more compact. And that's what I want to do. So anyway, getting started here about the, the technology that we're using. And this is just a few things some of you have seen already, because um, I, I know, because I recognize a lot of people are here. It's like, okay, you've seen a lot of this stuff, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, because, you know, my, my mission really is to just reach and teach. I want people to understand that there's a reason for these things, how and why they work. It's not just something that uh, I, I made up, you know, a couple of days ago and trying to sell somebody on it, because it does, in fact, work. I do want to sell them on the concept. But it, that's a concept that really does work, and there's reasons for it. And we talk about this dependence that we have on the infrastructure, and we lose the power grid, all these different things that make it up. And what's the probability of occurring? Well, it's 99.9% .9 in the current generation, however we want to define that. And if you're not familiar with that, then I'd recommend that you go to, go to YouTube, go to my website, you can go find the YouTube link on there. Go over and watch this program, The Worst Risk You Face. It's a short one. Uh, I think it's uh, 20 minutes long, something like that. I believe there's the Q&A I left with it. So, But it's it's not a long program. goes over things very briefly to give you a concept of why I talk about this being such a it, – it's really it's a guarantee. And then what happened is I thought about those things that changed my whole – mission focus of my mission on it hasn't changed it's to reach and teach but where i started which was all about cold weather and then going into these nine because they were sort of in there anyway and then to this concept what we've got to deal with is loss of the power grid because if you take care of being ready to deal with loss of the power grid using these nine provident living modules you've got pretty much everything else covered in, except for some of the very specific details about well a tsunami that's a little different and some of these others but you've got it covered and in doing that then what you need are practical realistic affordable answers to six conditions and considerations that i talk about and that are these six right here what's the base cause of the loss is it what climate are we talking about is it summer is it winter rural or city and if you're prepared to deal with loss of the power grid and every one of those then really you're covered, and it's all these nine. Well, the first one I want to start with for just a moment on just one of these points in here because I've been learning something that's becoming very, very important. As a matter of fact, I'll give you the definition of that in just a moment. So foundation, what's that all about? Well, it's about your attitude, your outlook, and how you're viewing things. 
the law of provident living is a foundation law on that. It's this simple thing of having the, you know, the spiritual, the attitude, the knowledge. And then knowledge is the thing that we've got to deal with because a lot of misunderstanding about knowledge. There's no knowledge on the Internet. There's no knowledge in a library. Uh, there, there's only, it's not knowledge, it's all information that's in there. So what is knowledge? Well, knowledge, my formula that I've given for years is it's not just having information on a subject. This class this morning is information. It's not knowledge. And, and a, a book is information. And so uh, how do you turn it into knowledge? Well, experience. It's proper information that you turn into experience here. But when you have the, the spiritual attitude knowledge, and then you end up with the right stuff is what it comes down to. So back to these considerations, these answers that we need to have for these right there. Now, here's the reason I wanted to share that with you, because this is something that has become apparent to me, and it's very important. And that is there's one unrecognized nutrient that's critical for your health and well-being, and it affects all nine of the modules and these six vital grid down considerations. One nutrient. So let's look at nutrition for just a moment. So we go into this module number five, which is nutrition, and then we ask some questions. Well, what's basic cellular nutrition? Just right down to the cell level. Well, one of them is oxygen. You don't have oxygen, you cut that off, all the cells die. In fact, we say, well, within about three minutes, they start dying and pretty soon they'll all be dead. So that's why this three minute rule. And then we have, well, water. Okay, you need water. Well, there's the three day rule, about three days, depending on the conditions, you're either gonna be dead or in the process of dying if you don't get some pretty soon. So then we come to nutrients. And of course, I always make the point I use nutrients rather than food because uh, a lot of things are being eaten as food, but they have nothing to do with nutrition. But it's the carbohydrates, the fats, the protein, the minerals, the vitamins, the phytonutrients, a whole bunch of other little things, little trace element things that are so critical. Okay, so that's three. We think of nutrients, so they all fall into that category. Uh, but then there's one more. And this one affects every one of those nine and the six. I've talked a little bit about it, but I've really come to, to recognize what it is, why it is, how critically important it is. And that's proper sleep. And we go like, proper sleep is nutrition? I mean, that, that doesn't seem right. That's, it's just sleep. It's just lay down, close your eyes, and rest. Okay. Well, there's a lot more to it than that, and why it is literally a nutrition is a way of looking at it. So the proper rest, what makes that up? Well, here's the book you should get. I'd recommend you get this book. The first of three, four chapters of the book is what's teaching about this. Now, if you're having trouble with sleep, uh, there might be some strategies in here that are really important. But this Dr. Winters, he's a, he's a sleep doctor. That's his whole profession for the past 20, 25 years. And he wrote this book to educate people about what it's all about because there's a lot of misconceptions about sleep. And I have a lot of those too. That's cl close your eyes, lay down, rest, you know, and you, you, you feel better. No, it's nutrition. Proper nutrition is uh, sleep is. So you have different kinds of sleep. One of them is you've got light sleep. Now that's really important because usually we drift on to kind of light sleep and then it'll it'll become the bridge between two other kinds of sleep. And you don't really want to move right into them directly. You want to go through light sleep going down and coming back up to them. And one of those sleeps is deep sleep. What's important about deep sleep is this is the time, one of the times when we're detoxifying, when you go into this deep, deep sleep, you detoxify. Sometimes you dream in deep sleep, but mostly you don't. It's just a time of really letting the body do some work to clean some things up. Then we have other sleep that you've probably heard about, and it's REM sleep. Now, REM sleep's the one I'm talking about, and the reason I talk about this idea of knowledge is because I now have knowledge. I've had information, read the book. I was getting some experience with this sleeping cocoon and what it was doing for me. Now I understand why I'm getting it and why I want to teach about it so much, because here's what REM sleep is about. All three of these need to be in there. REM sleep 
very curiously is when you disrupt your REM sleep, in other words, in, in the night you go through, uh, typically through three to maybe five or six cycles of light sleep into deep, then REM, then back into deep and light and back and forth in these things. And the REM sleep through the, your period of sleeping, which will be anywhere from, for most people, from six hours to eight hours, unless you're children, children will sleep much longer. They need that. Infants do. What do they do? They sleep 14, 15 hours a day. That's important. That's part of their, their building and their, their getting strong. They need that for their cells to be dividing and multiplying and, and all the work that they're doing. They need that. But here's the thing about disrupting REM sleep when you don't get it in its normal way. You become more susceptible to pain. Now, that's something I've been dealing with a lot with in the past four and a half years. Lots and lots of pain at, at times. So one of the things that I have noticed is as I got into this cocoon, it's therapeutic. I can't say that too publicly in there because it makes you sound like you're a doctor, but it's therapy. It's natural inborn therapy that's going on within the body that when it gets REM sleep, you're not as susceptible to pain. And I started noticing that. I don't hurt as much. I hurt plenty. There's still lots of pain, but it's it's like the edges off of it. And I have much less pain when I'm sitting. Sometimes I'm absolutely pain-free or so little pain, it might as well be pain-free. I don't even notice it. So that's important. But now the second one on that list right there, we're talking about pain, and this is about temperature. One of the things that I had no clue about besides the pain, I knew a little bit about detoxing and sleep. But the one that I had no clue about is the fact that when you go into REM sleep, now one of the things that happens, REM sleep when you dream, one of the things that has to happen so you don't act out your dreams, and you might be, you know, walking, running, climbing, uh, choking somebody, fighting, slugging, you become paralyzed. The motor control of your muscles, your big muscles, not your eyes, they move, and you can still sometimes talk on a few things. It doesn't paralyze your, your breathing and diaphragm and those things, but your big muscle movements in the legs, in the arms, in the body, they become paralyzed. Well, the other thing that paralyzes is your ability to control your temperature. That's what's so critical, and that's the reason why this cocoon is doing such a fabulous job. Think about it. When you become paralyzed, okay, I'm, I've, I've gone into REM sleep and now my muscles are paralyzed, my ability to, to shiver, my ability to move, my ability to regulate my body temperature is now stopped right where I was. Now, if I'm in a neutral, just perfect condition and the conditions in the house do not change wherever I am, in my sleeping bag, in my bedding, and the house stays the same temperature, no problem. But through the night, what happens? Well, temperature sometimes goes up and down, uh, and uh, the bedding may be less than what you need when you start with. So what do you do? You open the covers because you're overheating, then you close the covers because now you're chilly. You have to wake up. You have to come out of REM sleep to do that because you are paralyzed. If you're going to move the blankets, you have to come out of REM sleep so that you can now control those, even though you may not wake up all the way, so you move the blankets. And then you go back to sleep, but you've just disrupted your REM sleep because you got cold, you got hot. Now you're more susceptible to pain. You start to see what's going on here, why it is that this is so incredible. Now, here's the thing, the other thing about this knowledge that I've gained because of the experience I'm getting. I had the theory, I, you know, all I've used foam clothing and foam sleeping bags for years. And then I got this pod and it was so incredibly important to me. I'm sleeping better. I'm going into REM sleep. But the other thing that has really, really changed, this is the most remarkable one of all for me. The foundations for survival, this slide I just grabbed out of another class, it's about attitude and outlook. What has happened is my feelings of well-being, my attitude, my hope, has improved. Now, I've always been kind of a positive guy, and I've been doing what I've been doing for the past years, even though I've had all this difficulty of, uh, of with, with business and partners and things like that, and, and uh, economics, and then health, and, and, you know, the part attacks, and the strokes, and the damaged hips, and the back, and all this stuff from years ago. Uh, I've been going on pure grit, 
the fact that I made a commitment and I have a mission. Okay, I've been functioning in part because I have this mission that I know I'm to complete, that I'm to get done. And so I've been just forging ahead in these nine areas, in teaching the class, and needing to teach very much about this clothing and the cold weather because people are so clueless when it comes to cold weather and winter. And I want to get that published in there. So clothing, you know, personal portable shelter, and it's very important defense against the elements. Okay. Foundation for this. Most of you on here already know this. You've seen it, so it won't be very long. Really came from my father. And it all started in 1957 on our first snow camp. I'm 10 years old. Miserable. Now, he was my hero. We went. It was, you know, something you did. Uh, and then we did snow camping again and again. And, and the, the Boy Scouts started doing that. And then there was fire all the time. We had to have fire. Because fire was the great mitigator of being cold and wet out there. Because you were cold and wet all the time. And yes, you had lousy night sleep. I knew about lousy night sleeps in the winter and sleeping bag. Uh, then to this trip right here, which started to change everything, where my dad made the comment that this is a five-day snowshoe trip into the uh, high Pecos wilderness to visit Lake Catherine that had never been visited before in the winter. And coming out of that trip, he stopped at this point right here and said, we got to find a better way to do this or stop going. We're not massacres. That was our trail coming in. We're going out on the same trail. Well, that's when the foam clothing started. And the first thing was actually making the mukluks, these 1962 mukluks. We started having warm feet and then found this other shell to use. Then in 1967, I started making these others in there. But the other thing that happened right after the, the muckluck was, and it's like, oh, we can keep our feet warm. And that's wonderful. How about sleeping warm? Well, it became sleeping bags. I don't have the early pictures of the foam sleeping bag, but, but that's what it, the next thing. Then in, this is 1967, Boy's Life, November, about the poly bag. That was published in there about making one out of this funny home, making homemade sleeping bags out of this polyurethane foam plastic. And so that was talked about in there. Then in 1960, this would have been in 68, um, a little company, my dad went to them and the little Okate Corporation who was making some tents and said, how about making these foam sleeping bags? Okay, this is a 1968, 69 version of that sleeping bag right there. And it was, you know, rated for the, you know, 15 below zero or so. It was really nice. Just a simple bag. And when you get the right foam and the right materials and put it together correctly, it does a fabulous job. Now, in 1969, in popular science, see, this has some depth and history to it. There's a point. This isn't something that showed up last week. 1969, popular science did a little review on this thing with the poly bag, the any weather bag. Took it down to the Rio Grande River. Now, this was down in the Big Bend area. This was, I think, it was March, uh, you know, still pretty chilly and the nights are really cold. And so go down, throw this thing in the Rio Grande River, get it completely soaked, actually dunk it several times drag it up on the beach and get in the thing because of how it handled moisture. That was one of the points about the fact that you can get wet, sleep warm, and by the way, the bag dries out. You can go to bed in wet clothing, and by the way, they dry out in the cold. You can't do that with any other sleeping bag. It doesn't exist, the possibility to do that long term. So that was amazing to do that. Well, it made some for a while, but you know, see, foam sleeping bags are weird. They're, they're stiff and they're a little heavier and they're a little bulkier and they don't roll up as easy than just stuffing in a stuck sack and everything. So it doesn't really catch on until you get educated. That's what I found out about doing the clothing and the things I do because I've had the, the clothing in catalogs and online and in stores hanging on the shelf. It doesn't sell because it doesn't look like anything else. It doesn't feel like anything else. It's weird. Well, popular science and uh, 1989, November 1989, they did this review on the and wrote up about the Sub-Zero snow suit. And that picture, that image you see right there, that was in there, this drawing right there, was in that. Uh, that what came out of that in, um, let's see, when, I, I even forgot what it was. Uh, by the way, I was, I was working on this thing because it's so important. So I was up till 3 o'clock in the morning, and I've got somebody on this call that's going to admonish me for doing that. But this is so important. And once I'm on a roll, I can't shut it down. And so yeah, it's 3.30 this morning I went to bed, so excuse my mumbling. Anyway, this picture right here was what I put together. And I didn't make the drawing. In fact, 
Joanne Harlow made that drawing. Oh, I honor her for doing that because she could take the the sketches and the rough things in my aunt, arm waving and she'd turn it in. I'd explain things and she'd make an image for that. Really appreciate Joanne. And in fact, that's my basement little prototyping room that we had there in Pleasant Grove. And that's Joanne there doing things. And I'd tell her something and she'd go make a drawing and then she'd build it. So some of the things that you've seen or will see out of this, it's still based on what she did back in 1985, 86, 87. That was Joanne. Now, what we have to work with, and that we have to work with in this, you have to you have to understand how these things work. That's the laws of physics that's involved in this. And so the law of physics, the 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 one that's about the world around us, it's well, we, what we want to do is we want to retain the heat, release moisture. And some of you've heard me say that in the Winter Without Worries class that I teach, I have a more detailed description of that, and I go through this in great depth. I'm going to give you a little bit of it here so that you can see it as you see this picture, because this is actually a trademark for me. So we go take a look at this picture, and we've got all these arrows and things on it, and there's a lot of information in there. And if you understand the laws of physics and another set of laws that we have to deal with, that's the laws of physiology. You combine those two things together, and then you start to understand how this thing works. So in this picture right here, well, what you've got is you've got your, your skin and the depth of your skin, and you have the skin surface in there, and the body core temperature, let's say it's 98.6. It can vary somewhat. 98.6, the surface of your skin, usually when you're in a neutral situation, you'll be 88, 92, 94, 96. Now, I can get above that when you're getting really hot, but it's going to generally be a little cooler than the core is. And your body is designed to operate that way and feel just fine that way. So we've got those to deal with. And we're taking a look at, the well, the, here's the, the material. It's really simple. I, I define this thing sometimes it's so low-tech that it's high-tech. It's, it's passive in how it operates. It doesn't have anything active in it, but yet it performs because it exists. So you have the, this foam. That's the core. That's the heart of the whole thing, this, this urethane foam insulation, this matrix that traps air. That's all that it is. But it does in a very unique way compared to other insulation materials. On the inside, we have a liner fabric that has to be selected very carefully to do a specific job. And on the outside, we have an outer fabric. And all of these things are selected and put together in such a way that they can do a couple of things. One of them is that outer fabric is deflect the wind uh, and precipitation, you know, sleet, rain, things like that. But it's not waterproof. It must not be waterproof. Water repellency, when it's done right, is just fine. But the selecting of the materials is very important and how they're woven and put together. Okay, let's look at another layer in this thing. We've got, well, we've got body heat. Well, that's one of these rules. <laughs> retain the heat. So we've got body heat, and this job of insulation is to trap the heat next to the body if you want to stay warm. Now, if you need to stay cool, you want to release the heat and get rid of it. Then over on the right, you have the inside, the surface temperature of the inside of this ensemble that you're wearing. It's going to be about the same as your skin temperature. And it'll vary. It'll be higher, lower, depending on what's going on around you. And then the outside of it, you think about this on the outside. Well, you want it to be the same temperature as the outside. It'll be close. Let's say that it's 20 below zero outside. What you want to happen is you want the outside uh, fabric temperature to be 20 below zero. You want the inside to be, well, 92, 94 degrees. Now, what that means is there's a temperature gradient across that insulation material. And you want it to be smooth. Now, that's the thing that happens in this, is that the insulation is smooth. Here's what the foam looks like. And here's what typical layers look like. Now, sometimes those layers may be very thick if it's a puffy parka or a sleeping bag that might be filled with down or with fibers. But they talk about using layers in those things. Well, we don't layer. It's a monolayer system. You want a monolayer system because of what happens with this temperature gradient. Layers cause problems in the temperature gradient because it has little kinks and little bends in it that uh, will cause moisture to collect because layers always, always, always collect moisture in between the layers. It's not they might collect moisture, they will collect moisture. So that smooth temperature gradient 
going from 90 plus degrees inside to below zero on the outside doesn't have any kinks or, or, or knees in it, knees in these curves. That's about heat flow and fluid transfer that I learned that I you know, was working with when I was dealing with nuclear reactors and reactor cores and the reactor plates and everything in there and the boundary layers. We had to learn those things. And that's when I said, that's how this works. It's very much like the core of a reactor with fluid flowing through it. Okay. Well, that sounds a little weird, but it's true. Then there's one other here. We have another set of arrows, and here we have the blue moisture. And, you know, the law of physics is we want to retain the heat. We do not do any wicking. If something says it's wicking material, you don't want that. I don't want wicking. So none of these fabrics are wicking fabrics. The foam is not wicking. It's very hydrophobic. It doesn't like moisture. It doesn't want to absorb moisture, but it's full of holes, so it'll pass right through it. Law of physics. Here we go back to these laws of physics. Law of physics says that moisture will, not might or should, it says moisture will move from where it's warm to where it's cold. Inside this clothing, it is warm, and there's moisture in there. And that moisture wants to go to the outside. And so you have these fabrics and materials that, number one, they don't like water. They're hydrophobic. And so they, they repel the water, but they're full of holes, so it'll pass through them. So literally, the water vapor is drawn to the outside because water has a vapor pressure over it at a given temperature. The vapor pressure is pretty low by the time it gets to freezing, zero C. The vapor pressure is quite low. There's still a little vapor pressure, but it's low. So the vapor pressure on this warm water inside with you is quite high at these 90 plus degrees. Outside, it's like a vacuum. It wants to go to the outside. Don't put any waterproofing. Don't put any waterproofing breathable air or materials like cotton wool or down that pick up, absorb, and hold moisture. It just wants out. Let it out. So we come back to this picture, and this is really the description of the whole technology right there in that picture. I need to redo some things so that I can show it you know, accurately. Here's the rules. The law of physics is retain body heat, release moisture when you're trying to stay insulated. Now, there's some other laws I'm going to talk about for just a moment because you have to recognize these things. And I could, I could spend a half hour on each one of these. I won't do that today. I want to figure out how to tell them very quickly. But we have the laws of human physiology. The fact that you are a living creature, that you regulate your temperature, except when you're in REM sleep, you're trying to stay warm and regulate this temperature. So the body is shifting blood supply around to the extremities, to the surface skin. It's withdrawing it from there because it wants to regulate its temperature and keep it at a constant 98.6, thereabouts. So your body is dynamic. You'll see one of these words down here about dynamic, the dynamic human environment, because you're very dynamic. You're flexible. You move. You talk. You think. You breathe. You're, you're flexing your muscles. You're in and out as you breathe air, you know, and so you're, you're this thing that moves all the time, except when you're in REM sleep and then you're paralyzed. I think we keep coming back to that because that's so critical to the, how this thing works. Okay. But you sweat. Your temperature goes up and down and you give off moisture. As a matter of fact, it's not the fact that you sweat. It's the fact that going through your skin 24-7 is small amounts of moisture before you sweat. Sweating is a, is a response to overheating so that you'll cool. But if you're, you're neutral right now and if you want to prove this to yourself, just go get a, a Ziploc bag. Pull it over your hand. Right now you're in this neutral temperature. You might even be cool. Pull it over your hand and watch what happens, all the fog in it. In fact, stick your hand in the freezer in a plastic bag. Watch how quickly that fog builds up on the inside of that plastic bag. Moisture is being sucked out of your body by your hand in your freezer that's, you know, five degrees below zero. It wants to go out, yet you have a plastic barrier to stop it. Oh, there's an there's a illustration that will teach you about these things.